before I start, thank you, uh, Pat. Thank you, Greg, of course, for having me here, and Pian for organizing, and Karen for being Karen. And um, before I start, I was just listening to Peter talk. Um, made me sort of think about the issues that we're confronting here today and the issues whistleblowers are confronting. Uh, and what scientists do and what journalists do are similar, and that we're both supposed to be establishing reliable knowledge about the universe, journalists and whatever beat we're covering, scientists and whatever their discipline is. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, with journalism, what I, where, well, what I know best, there's kind of two ways to do it. So you can canvass the experts, which is what you're supposed to do as a daily reporter or a, a, when you're writing for a weekly, you call up 10 leading experts in the field and you report what they think. Or you can be an investigative journalist where you say, I want to establish why the experts think what they think and I want to understand how they came to these opinions and I want to look at the evidence to see if their opinions are correct. So if you're an investigative journalist, or a, a, a scientist, you're supposed to actually be looking at the evidence and the history of the evidence to understand how the experts came to their conclusions. And if you're misfortunate enough to go through that exercise and conclude that the experts' conclusions are not valid, that they embraced assumptions along the way that hadn't been well tested in science, you end up in a situation where you, now you're in the whistleblower situation. Now what you're going to write is going to differ from the consensus. And you're going to imply that the experts did their jobs poorly. Um, the first time, one of the times, uh, about 10 years ago, I gave a version of this talk at the Pennington Biomedical Research Institute. And at the end of the talk, one of the researchers, Pennington is a leading obes uh, academic obesity researcher in the country. At the end of the talk, uh, one of the uh, researchers in the audience, a very distinguished man, he looked to be in his mid-60s, raised his hand and very politely in the Q&A said, Mr. Taub, is it fair to say that one subtext of your talk is you think we are all idiots? <laughs> and that is indeed the subtext of the talk. <laughs> because I'm coming from the perspective, right? I'm a journalist, I've looked at the research, I've decided they're wrong at what they do and what they've spent their whole life doing, and what they get enormous amount of respect for doing, and enormous, all their career advancement has come from doing what they do, and I'm coming and saying they, they screwed it up. I couldn't say that. I had to figure out a way to phrase this that wasn't insulting, but that's the subtext. So when I do what I do, or uh, any journal, there are only a few journalists that have engaged in the exercise I've engaged in. Nina Teicholz is another one. And she's concluded that the conventional wisdom is wrong. When Peter does what he does and he looks at the, the literature to go back and say, you know, are my colleagues right? Is the conventional thinking right? I'm going to go back and assess the evidence myself. It's a, it's a nightmare scenario if you conclude something other than the experts. And yet the only way to really know what you're talking about, right, is to understand the history of your ideas, where they come from. How can you know what you're talking about if you don't understand where they come from? where the basis is. So one part of my lecture is going to be about the history of these ideas, because I find when I'm lecturing to medical audiences or giving grand rounds, I'm talking about things that doctors believe in their hearts to be 100% absolute facts of, of the universe, and yet they could not tell me where those facts, where these hypotheses came from. We could talk about something outside their field like physics, relativity, and they could tell me it came from Einstein, or gravity, and it's Newton, or even electromagnetic, you know, waves, and they'll say, you know, you'll know those, but if I were to say, where's the origin of this idea that we get fat because we eat too much? And it's like, who really knows? So, um, in the course of my research as an investigative journalist, I wanted to know where these ideas came from. I wanted to understand, and this to me is a fundamental idea in all of medical uh, nutrition-related science. So I'm going to skip my disclosures, because the only one I have of interest now is CrossFit. Um, context. This is the mess, OK? This is one way to document the mess, the obesity epidemic. The diabetes epidemic is actually more frightening, because if you go back to the early 1960s, the incidence of diabetes in America, according to the CDC, which may or may not be trustworthy, has increased about 700%. So imagine any other disease in this country, incidents increasing 700%, and you would not be able to stop talking about it, 
The reason we continue, we do not talk about this is because the assumption is that type 2 diabetes is a type that associates with obesity. And um, uh, age is caused by getting fatter. And we know why people get fat. Um, one reason it should be important is because we know that obesity increases the risk of every major chronic disease, including cancer and Alzheimer's and fatty liver disease. And the conventional wisdom, again, is that as we get fatter, um, that's why uh, we get all these diseases. The alternative hypothesis would be whatever makes us fat <coughs> might be driving up these disease rates as well. So that's sort of a different causal pathway, a different hypothesis, and it's the one that I've been assuming in my research, I took to assuming in my research, had a high likelihood of being true. Um, and by cause, I mean the, the dietary societal trigger to these diseases. Um, but the key question then becomes, why do we get fat? Um, what's the driving cause of obesity? And here's the conventional wisdom. This, you, know, you could find a line like this on every major um, health organization website in the world. The fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between calories consumed and calories expended. Uh, this is from a 2017 obesity path. This is an endocrine society scientific statement on the cause of obesity, and it was a 28-page paper with hundreds and hundreds of references, but it makes this statement from a thermodynamic perspective. It's clear that obesity is generally the consequence of small cumulative imbalances of intake and expenditure. That is your fundamental hypothesis. Uh, it's an energy balance disorder, although the uh, endocrine society statement now calls it an energy homeostasis disorder because homeostasis has more letters in it and more <laughs> syllables, which makes it sound more scientific. Um, calories in greater than calories out. We overeat. The biblical terminology would be gluttony and sloth. Um, so this is the hypothesis. Too much food, too little physical activity leads to overeating. Energy in greater than energy out, and the result is obesity and the obesity epidemic. That is the fundamental hypothesis. That's the Newton's gravity of obesity, diabetes, chronic disease relationships. And the question you could ask, which I did, is what's the evidence supporting it? Where does it come from? Is it true? This is a science. When I'm trying to annoy the research community in discussions, I'll occasionally say, let's pretend this is a science. And we can. <laughs> question our hypotheses, okay? Maybe it was handed down with the stone tablets, um, but let's find out. Um, so the origins and context, and what's interesting, it, is it has an origin. It is indeed a hypothesis, and the origin dates to the late 1860s with the birth of modern nutrition science in Germany and the creation of this device, which was a calorimeter to measure energy expenditure in in this case, animals large enough to fit in here, so a dog or a human. So you can measure the energy intake in the foods we eat by burning them in a bomb calorimeter. And now, beginning in the 1860s, you can measure the energy expenditure of animals in humans. So for the next 50 years, all of nutrition science is vitamin and mineral deficiencies and the effects of vitamins and minerals, because you can measure that and you can study it in animals and you could see the effects in humans in calorimetry. And if you go back and look at histories of nutrition science written in the 1930s, you'll find that virtually every chapter is on vitamins, minerals, protein, maybe fiber, energy intake and expenditure. And one thing you learn about science when you study the history of science is our ideas are dependent on the technologies we have to observe the universe. So if all you could observe related to obesity is the intake and expenditure of energy, you end up with a theory related to the intake and expenditure of energy. And so by the early 1900s, um, well, along the way, uh, 1880s, Max Rubner demonstrates, so the laws of thermodynamics are being developed in the second half of the 19th century. Max Rubner demonstrates that these laws hold true for living organisms. He establishes that this idea, the isodynamic law of calories, which today we know of as a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. So it doesn't matter what food, the same, what macronutrient, it all carries the same amount of energy into the body. 
And then in 1890s, two Americans, Atwood and Water and Benedict, spent a few years of their life showing that thermodynamics hold true for humans, and they pioneered really the science of calorimetry in humans and the importance of calories in the discussion. And what's interesting about Atwater and Benedict is they said they had no doubt that the laws of thermodynamics hold true for humans, but they still had to demonstrate it. Because if they didn't demonstrate it, they might be wrong. Or they still had to test it, would be a better way to put it. So they spent years of their life testing it to find out that their assumption that it surely does hold true was actually true. And then, being in the 1900s, this German diabetes and obesity, early 1900s, Carl von Norden was the leading obesity and diabetes expert in Germany. He was an expert authority. And he came up with this idea that basically caloric imbalance is the cause. He was the first one to state it. There was always this idea that, that people got fat because they ate a lot. And I'll discuss that a little later. But he wrote it down. He said, the ingestion of a quantity of food greater than that required by the body leads to an accumulation of fat and to obesity should the disproportion be continued over a considerable period. And Newberg's work began to be accepted, and Lewis Newberg came along. Lewis Newberg was at the University of Michigan. He was a physiologist. He did some very interesting work in, in, in diabetes. Um, he proved that you can be dead wrong about one subject in science and be absolutely right about another, and that those two states are not mutually uh, inclusive. So Newberg, working on the basic... Um, Based on the work of Hilda Brook, who I'll also get into, Hilda Brook was a German uh, clinician who had come over in 1933, fleeing the Nazis, a German Jewish pediatrician. She was uh, running the first pediatric obesity clinic at Columbia, and she had always heard that obese children are maybe eat like birds, maybe they don't eat a lot, so she did a very uh, comprehensive study of 200 children and their families where she interviewed the kids and she interviewed the parents, and she concluded that indeed most of these children really did have quite voracious appetites if they were allowed to express it. And so that led to Newberg's revelation, which is that all obese persons are alike in one fundamental respect. They literally overeat. And therefore, an interesting assumption, obesity is caused by either a perverted appetite, which is eating too much, or lessened outflow of energy, which was insufficient expenditure. So Newberg actually, uh, if you're going to talk about the genesis of this theory, von Norden, uh, is the originator, and then Newberg was to von Norden what Huxley was to Darwin. Um, there was a problem, though, with this theory, which is if obese people get fat because they eat too much, we'll talk about how much is too much shortly, um, why don't they compensate? Okay, they, they, you don't, you're not born obese, or most people aren't. You get obese slowly, so somewhere along the line, you should be able to eat less or exercise more and on, in, you know, bring your system back into balance, because these things are under conscious control, and so you need an explanation for that. And Newberg said, well, because they suffer from various human weaknesses, such as overindulgence and ignorance. So they're actually too stupid or they don't care. And now you've taken a physiological disorder and turned it into a psychological disorder. And I, I don't like to show photos of researchers. I show the photo of Newberg, because I think this is vitally important to understanding obesity. When you look like Lewis Newberg, when you're lean, and you eat in moderation, it's natural to believe that anyone could be lean if they ate in moderation. And if they're not lean, er ergo, they're not eating in moderation. If you guys, if any of you have read uh, Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, he has this brilliant concept, why see Addy, which is what you see is all there is. And if you're lean, what you see is, I eat, I'm lean, I eat in moderation, that's all there is. And then you make assumptions about why other people aren't lean. Um, a lot of the revelation in my new book, I was, I think I have a chapter called In Praise of Fad Diets, where I point out that all the people who have moved forward the uh, low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet movement were doctors who may have started off like Newberg but started getting fat. And so now they can experience a different perspective on life and they could come to different conclusions. So you have this theory that starts with this idea that energy in has to be greater than energy out, and the result is and stored as fat, and then you put the cause in the brain. That's what Newberg sort of institutionalized. So now you've got ignorance, self-indulgence, gluttony, and sloth as the cause of a physiological disorder. 
And it seemed simple to them. It seemed obvious. And it always has. When I interviewed all these obesity researchers, and I mean, over the course of four years, I interviewed virtually all of them who were still alive, who had played any important role going back even you know, to the late 1950s. Um, this is the way they thought about obesity, which is basically you've got a character like Falstaff who was obese and had this love for life. There's a quote in Henry IV about Falstaff eating this poor woman out of house and home, and they assume that this is why Falstaff got fat, this is why everyone got fat. And then you could starve people, and they get thin. You could starve animals, and they get thin. You could starve people. And the line I heard too often is there were no obese people coming out of the concentration camps, which is incredibly bad taste, but was an interesting observation. So what you learn is if I starve someone, they get thin. If I force feed someone or I find someone who's obese and they eat a lot, they get fat. Therefore, obesity is caused by this energy imbalance. And there's so many assumptions built into that, so many ifs. If I starve someone and they get thin, does that, why is it some people can be thin without starving? You just have to ask different questions to start getting different answers. And one of the questions you want to ask is, what's the size of the effect we're talking about? How much caloric imbalance is necessary? Do you have to be like Falstaff? Do you have to go to the bar every night and eat the, you know, a three roast chickens and drink for seven beers to get fat? And as the CDC tells us, weight management is all about balancing the number of calories you consume with the number of calories your body uses or burns off. So how much are we talking about? Like if we're gaining, say, two pounds a year, this is what many adults do in their life. So you gain two pounds a year, beginning in your late 20s, early 30s, and you go from being relatively lean to obese. A lot of us in middle age go through that. How many calories do we have to store as fat to accomplish that every day? How much do we have to overeat? It's two pounds a year, and a pound of fat is roughly, depending on who you talk to, which is not Zoe, 3,500 kilocalories is the reason. I say that because Zoe did an interesting analysis of where this number comes from. And what you find in nutrition, once you start digging into it, is that you don't have a lot of evidence base for anything. So even somebody like me who spent my entire life or the last 20 years of my life digging into the data, there are things that I don't dig into because I just don't have time. So I'm going to assume this number, 3,500 kilocalories. In fact, when you go to the dietitian, the dietitian says if you eat 500 calories less every day than you expend, you will lose a pound of fat a week. It's because of that number, and that's why they give that advice. So you just calculate. It's a very simple calculation. Two pounds a year times 3,500 calories per pound divided by 365 days, and you end up with a fat storage of 19 calories per day, okay? So if over the past 10 years you gained 20 pounds and your best friend or your sister did not, that's because you stored 19 calories a day in your fat tissue and he or she didn't. 19 calories, that's the equivalent of a couple of peanuts, three almonds, Four olives, two gummy bears. <laughs> okay, not a lot. Now, you could remember, we're talking about the calories stored as fat, not the amount of calories that have to be consumed in excess to end up with this number. But one way or the other, it's a tiny number, especially when you consider the average American consumes about 2,700 calories a day. So that's a 0 .007 positive energy balance. If you look at the obesity epidemic that we're so concerned about, the mess, on average, Americans are 30 pounds heavier than they were in 1960. That's an average weight gain of 0.53 pounds per year. So that's a five calorie a day imbalance. That's 0 0.002 positive energy imbalance. It's half a gummy bear, okay, stored as fat that wasn't consumed. So if you think of it from my perspective, I'm a relatively big guy. I might eat 3,000 calories a day. A bite of food, those three almonds are about 20 calories, so I might have 150 swallows of food. If I burn off, 100, burn off or excrete 149 of them, and the 150th ends up trapped in my fat cells, I'm going to get obese. Okay, that's the kind of energy imbalance we're talking about. Not only that, the interesting thing is when you eat a meal, a mixed meal, you actually store all the fat you eat first. So if I consume of those 3,000 calories, if I'm an average American and 50% are fat, 40% are fat, so that's 
what is that, 1,200 calories a day of fat, all those 1,200 calories are going to go into my fat tissue at some point. And if 20 of them get stuck there, I'm going to get obese over the course of 10 to 20 years. I mean, if only 10 get stuck in the fat tissue, I'm going to get obese. It's just going to take longer. You have to have perfect energy balance. You can't have any getting stuck if you're staying in energy balance. So with the, I first saw this calculation done in a 1937 textbook, maybe 1936. Eugene Dubois was the leading authority on metabolism in the US pre-World War II. And he went through this calculation, the exact same numbers. Actually, Van Norden did a version of the calculation 30 years earlier. And he said, there's no stranger phenomenon than the maintenance of a constant body weight under marked variation in bodily activity and food consumption. You know, we eat different amounts every day. We work out different amounts every day. We have no idea how much we're eating or expending. The world's, you know, if there's a Guinness World Record holder in calorie counting, they cannot be this good. And yet, most of us maintain a pretty stable body weight for years on end. Even obese individuals may gain 40 or 50 pounds and then maintain that 50 pound body weight. So the question is, how is that done? And there are all kinds of shortcomings of this hypothesis. That was one of the things I realized I did my research. Um, if you get fat because you eat too much, then eating less shouldn't work. Luckily, um, I don't think Peter's entirely with us, so he won't mind this. Um, citation of Cochrane. Um, this was from a 2000 trial, by the way, that got pulled because the community didn't like this citation of trial. And while weight loss achieved in trials of calorie restricted diets is so small as to be clinically insignificant, um, exercising more or increasing your energy expenditure through aerobic exercise, I mean, very uh, that also doesn't work. I mean, I could cite meta-analyses of the clinical trials done. I find this more compelling. The American Heart Association and the American College of Sports Medicine in 2007 published Joint Physical Activity Guidelines. And these are people you would expect to advocate for physical activity and to want to find every way to spin the data to make it more likely to get us to work out. And they said it's reasonable to assume that persons with relatively high daily energy expenditures would be less likely to gain weight over time compared with those who have low energy expenditures, which is the logical equivalent of saying it's more likely for me to lose weight. If I'm a couch potato and I become a marathon runner, then if I remain a couch potato, and then it says so far data to support this hypothesis are not particularly compelling. And the hypothesis is 100 years old, 150 years old, and if the data are not particularly compelling, you should seriously consider the possibility that you've got the wrong hypothesis. And my favorite study to this effect was, I think it was a Danish study, where they took 20 couch potatoes and over the course of a year trained them to run a marathon. And at the end of the year, they ran a marathon. I could never run more than eight miles in my life. My body breaks down. Um, the men, on average, lost five pounds of body fat at the end of the year, and the women, on average, had 0% change in body fat. And this was published in the 1980s, and back then the Danes suggested that maybe the reason they didn't lose weight is because they compensated for all that exercise by increasing their consumption of carbohydrates. Um, genetics. Men and women fatten differently. No, excuse me. Identical twins have virtually the same bodies. This is a pair of identical twins. These are photos from pre-World War II European textbooks that thought it was interesting. Like today, when you see a chapter on obesity in a, in a textbook, a medical textbook, there'll be the sort of generic photo of somebody really fat and dressed badly, holding food, walking away from you in a country fair. And then there might be a few mice photos. Pre-World War II Europe, they thought, you know, what we want to know is why people accumulate fat. And when you want to know why they accumulate excess fat, you also want to answer questions like where they accumulate excess fat, because that'll tell you something about the why. And when they accumulate excess fat, because that'll tell you something about the why. So it actually helps to study real human beings. So you have two identical twins. The lean twins have, who practice perfect energy balance. This was considered lean pre-World War II. And the obese twins, and the question is, not why are the obese twins fatter, but why is their fat accumulation identical? We know that identical twins don't just have the same body types, have the same facial characteristics, they have the same body types. So what is controlling that? And what do the calories they consume have to say about this um, genetic transmission of excess fat location? 
And then sexual variations. Men and women fatten differently. So men get fat above the waist and women get fat, tend to get fat below the waist. If their fat cells are just sucking up excess calories, why aren't they sucking up excess calories everywhere? Why are they doing it in specific locations? And this fellow doubled his risk of heart disease by getting fat above the waist. That woman did not. So what does that have to do about how much calories they consume and expend? Surely something else is regulating fat accumulation, which is why these photos are in the textbooks. Puberty is another example. This is obviously not a pre-World War II photo, but it was an example that these pre-World War II Europeans brought up. And I'm going to be channeling the way they think of obesity when I give you the history of the second hypothesis. But boys and girls enter puberty with relatively the same amount of body fat on them. Boys go through puberty, they actually lose fat and gain muscle. And the girls go through puberty and they gain fat. And they gain fat in very specific places to make them feminine or mature and to drive the boys crazy. <laughs> and when they, by the time they get out of puberty, the girls have 50% more fat on their bodies than the men on average. So puberty is an obesogenic or an adipogenic phenomenon for women, but not for boys. So clearly, they're both overeating. They're both taking in more calories than they expand because they're getting taller and heavier. Their body mass is increasing one way or the other, not their body mass index. Their body mass. But the boys lose fat and gain muscle, and the girls gain fat and gain in very specific. Obviously, sex hormones, right? Growth hormones are driving growth. Sex hormones are determining the differences in fat accumulation. So these are hormonal forces determining fat accumulation. Why don't we talk about hormonal forces determining fat accumulation when we talk about this caloric imbalance issue? So the fatal flaw with the energy imbalance hypothesis is an obvious one. And it's so obvious that when I talk about it, I must be wrong, OK? So this goes beyond whistleblowing. This is, yeah, it's funny. When you, I lectured about this, or I did radio shows back 15 years ago with authorities, I would often say things like this. And they would say, that can't be right, like listening to Zoe about like, the saturated fat content in a steak. Uh, the, a woman from CSPI, when I was discussing that, the not as informed version of it 20 years ago, said on the air, but that can't be right. But it is. So first law of thermodynamics is energy conservation. That's why we believe in this overeating hypothesis. Um, this is it. It's, and you'll hear, yeah, that's why you see thermodynamics quoted in papers on obesity. You don't see them quoted in papers on cancer. You don't see them quoted in papers on height. But when you're talking about fat accumulation, so change in fat mass equal to energy consumed minus energy expended. This delta E is a change, E in, E out. Um, and the idea is if I eat more, E in goes up, and I ex don't uh, compensate by expending more than delta E is going up. Okay, so and then this is uh, assumed to mean that because I eat more, that's a cause of obesity. Or if I expend less but I don't compensate by eating less, delta E goes up. So sedentary behavior is a cause, and that's the basis of this belief system. And the flaw here is there's no arrow of causality in this. This is an association. What this says, energy is always conserved. So if the energy goes up, intake has to be more than expanded. That means energy is entering the system. And if energy is entering the system, or more energy than leaving, that's all it says. It says nothing about why the stored energy went up. It only says that if it did go up, more energy entered the system than left because energy is conserved. It's a tautology. OK, a tautology is something that's always true but tells you nothing. Um, remember this statement, the fundamental cause of obesity and overweight is an energy imbalance between calories. Imagine the financial analogy to this. Imagine I was lecturing about wealth accumulation, which a lot of people like to hire le um, lecturers to hear about. And the World Economic Forum had said the fundamental cause of wealth is a money imbalance between dollars earned and dollars spent. Right? If you want to get rich, you've got to make more money than you spend. Can I have my paycheck now? <laughs> um, you never see this in a paper because it's inane, right? It's 
clearly, if someone's getting rich, they're making more money than they spend. Bill Gates is making a lot more money than he spends. Gary Taubes is making a little more money than he spends. <laughs> I'm not rich, so it doesn't really define wealth. It's absurd, and you would never see it. But in obesity, it's the law. Dollars in greater than dollars out. Um, so here's the alternative hypothesis, and this is the point of my research. One of the benefits of going back to history is you could find, was there a competing hypothesis to explain what we are concerned about? And lo and behold, it turns out it would. And this is it. So in this hypothesis, you start with first principles. Instead of saying obesity is a sort of energy balance or overeating, like if somebody walks into your office and you're a physician and they're obese, you shouldn't think, gee, I wonder how much they eat and exercise. But this person has an overeating disorder, an energy balance disorder. What they've got is an excess fat accumulation. They have a fat accumulation disorder. And if you start with that thought, without any assumptions attached, you might ask the question, what regulates fat accumulation? Because that's going to be my, my prime suspect. And in this hypothesis, gluttony and sloth are compensatory effects or not causes. So what we're going to do is we're going to flip the assumed law of causality. The conventional wisdom says that changes in intake and expenditure are what drive changes in fat storage. And this hypothesis says that fat storage, like everything else in the human body, is very well regulated. And if we change fat, the regulation of fat storage, to take in more calories as fat or to let out, we're going to have compensatory effects on how much people eat and exercise. Okay, it's a German-Austrian hypothesis. It dates to pre-World War II. And the two leading proponents were Gustav von Bergmann and Julius Bauer. So von Bergmann was the leading authority on clinical medicine in Germany through the Second World War. The, one of the most prestigious prizes by the German Society of Internal Medicine is the Gustav von Bergmann Medal. Okay, he was not a quack. He was not a fringe element. And Julius Bauer was the leading authority in endocrinology and chronic disease at the um, uh, University of Vienna, which was one of the great universities in the world pre-World War II. Um, here's how Bauer described this theory in the Archives of Internal Medicine, 1941. He said, like a malignant tumor or like the fetus, the uterus or the breasts of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue, I have to define this term, lipophilia. Um, one of the observations they made is that there are points on the human body, there are tissues in the human body that want to accumulate fat, and there are tissues that don't. So for instance, if you look at the back of your hands or feel your forehead, these are areas of the body that don't accumulate fat easily. There are other places that do, and you probably all know where they are, and they're probably a little different on everyone. You know, love handles, or double chins, or thick ankles, or, you know, the gut of a man and the lower body of a woman. And they described, one of the experiments, one of the observations they had to discuss this was a young woman at the turn of the, end of the 19th century, who had a bad burn on the back of her hand. And so they took a graft of skin from her stomach to put it on the back of her hand, and then she grew up to be an obese adult, and she had this big fat tuft of fat on one hand, but not on the other. And they said, well, clearly there's something about the tissues that are lipophilic, that love to accumulate fat. So I can move the tissue from here to here, and it will still accumulate fat, even when it's in a part of the body. So they use lipophilia to define that characteristic, love of fat. So the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. A lipomatous subject may die of starvation and still remain lipomatous. Um, the way I think about it, I think we've got this world of greyhounds out there. A lot of you guys are greyhounds. And you look at basset hounds, and you think, you know, if I could just get them to run around the track, I could turn them into greyhounds. <laughs> <laughs> I could get them to eat less. I could turn them into greyhounds. But if you run the basset hound around the track or you starve it, you end up with an emaciated, exhausted basset hound. OK, you don't end up with a thin person. Thin people and fat people, by this theory, are constitutionally different. Some of us accumulate fat, we're lipophilic. Some of us don't. 
Okay, the effect, and what's interesting is this hypothesis was growing in Europe, and by the late 1930s, it was being accepted everywhere. And it required, so the, the lingua franca of medicine pre-World War II was German. So it required people like Bauer writing articles in English-speaking papers and a textbook being written, um, a, a translation of uh, the German metabolism textbook being written and, and translated into English so Americans could start thinking, there's another way to think about this other than this gluttony and sloth. Russell Wilder was a leading authority on obesity and diabetes at the Mayo Clinic. He said the effect after meals of withdrawing from the circulation, even a little more fat than usual, might well account both for the delayed sense of satiety and for the frequently abnormal taste for carbohydrates encountered in obese persons. A slight tendency in this direction, 20 calories a day, would have a profound effect. The hypothesis deserves serious consideration. Hugo Roney wrote the first monograph on obesity in the U.S. He was a, uh, a Hungarian endocrinologist who came to the U.S. and worked in Chicago, and his obesity and leanness. When I say the first monograph, this was the first serious text on the science written in the U.S. in anything other than a small article form. And he said this theory was now more or less fully accepted, chiefly in Germany, by a number of leading investigators. And then World War II happens. Okay? And the alternative hypothesis literally becomes another victim of World War II. I mean, it's fascinating. You can see that. I'm going to document this for you in the literature. So in 1941, Bauer wrote a review article, which he published in Annals of Internal Medicine, and it was about 20 pages. And Bauer had fled Austria in 1938 with the invasion by Germany. He had moved to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, and then he had moved to Hollywood, where he ended up working in a hospital run by the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, the current energy theory of obesity, which considers only an imbalance between intake of food and expenditure of energy, is unsatisfactory. It's the distribution of energy in the body, too, which counts, not alone the rough imbalance between its intake and output. The adipose tissue is not merely a passive storing place for reserve fat, but a living and active part of the body. He spends the first half of this 20-page paper debunking Newberg's hypothesis. An increased appetite with a subsequent imbalance between intake and output is a consequence of the abnormal enlage. Enlage is a German term, which means sort of genetic predisposition, rather than the cause of obesity. So people are predisposed to accumulate fat. They fatten easily, and if they do, they have to take in more energy than they expend, so it's either going to make them hungrier or it's going to make them sedentary. The suggestion of von Bergman, so now Newb Lewis Newberg responds. This is like bloggers arguing <laughs> today, but it's fine. There it took a year to get a response into print. New Newberg's response was 70 pages long, okay? Not a lot of people are publishing science during the World War II years, so it's easy to get these things published. The suggestion of von Bergman, so volubly defended by Bauer, that the fat cells of obese persons possess an abnormally great affinity for fat and an exaggerated capacity for retaining it, finds no support in experiments designed to test its validity. Bodybuilders inherited obesity is not. End of statement. In a 70-page paper, um, Newberg spent about a page, page and a half, explaining that von Bergman and Bauer didn't know what they were talking about. Here's the death of a hypothesis. Thanks to the Thomson Reuters Web of Science, you could look at the citations for these papers. Okay, so Bauer's, which was probably the single best paper written on obesity up until that time, was published in 1941. And by 1959, it had 10 citations. 10 papers had referenced it. And then not again until my book comes out in 2007. Newberg published two papers in 43 and a follow-up in 44. And they continue to get cited through the end of the 1970s when the calorie balance hypothesis is so well established, you no longer have to cite anyone. Like, you don't have to cite Darwin when you talk about evolution. Um, this is the death of a hypothesis, and it was all the post-war. Um, nobody read the German language literature anymore. The lingua franca of medicine shifted from German to English with the war. Post-war, a whole generation of young researchers came along who had fought in the war and hated the Germans. Um, Jean Mayer, who became the leading nutritionist in the country in the 1960s, was one of them. And they wouldn't read the German literature, and they didn't want to embrace a German hypothesis. 
And you see this in many areas of science, except physics, where we're willing to embrace anything if it allowed us to build bombs. Um, that was it. That was the death of the alternative hypothesis. The interesting thing is, beginning in the late 1930s, they started doing animal models of obesity to try and understand the etiology of the animal models. And one of the interesting findings, what would John Mayer reported himself, Mayer studied a genetic strain of obese mice in the 50s, and he said these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. So these uh, genetic uh, surgical models of obesity, um, they didn't get fat because they ate too much, they got fat if they ate at all. Okay, they accumulated fat in their fat tissue, that's what they did, and when you half starved them or fully starved them, they would die of starvation before they would release the fat stored in their fat tissue. So, uh, uh, like the um, uh, leptin deficient mice, you could starve them to death and they'll die with more fat on their bodies than a lean litter mate um, when it's eating uh, ad libitum. So if obesity is a sort of excess fat accumulation, a hormonal regulatory disorder, the question is what regulates fat accumulation? That should be the first question you're always asking. Okay, somebody comes in your office, they're 300 pounds, don't ask them how many times they eat at McDonald's. Wonder what's going on with their regulation of fat accumulation. And what's interesting is the community didn't care. So this is Hilda Brook, I mentioned her earlier, the leading authority on childhood obesity in the mid-20th century. In a wonderful book she wrote on obesity in 1957, she said, looking at obesity without preconceived ideas, one would assume that the main trend of research should be directed towards an examination of abnormalities of the fat metabolism, since by definition, excessive accumulation of fat is the underlying abnormality. It so happens that this is the era in which the least work has been done. In 1973, she wrote another book as she was ending her career on obesity and anorexia, which had become her specialty, and she said, I still can't find it in the literature. This is disorder of excess fat accumulation. It's a disorder of fat metabolism. In 1963, uh, Edwin Aswood, who was a leading endocrinologist in the country at that time, gave, was president of the Endocrine Society, gave a presidential address to the Endocrine Society that was on, um, running late. Uh, he was uh, uh, trying to overturn this idea that obesity was caused by gluttony. And beautiful address talking about how inane it was to think that fat people just overeat and underexercise when you've got dozens of hormones and enzymes and receptors that are regulating the flow of fat in the human body, the use of fat for fuel, the storage of fat in fat cells, and begging people to study the use of you know, this fat metabolism. And they weren't doing it. By the 1960s, the obesity field was dominated by psychiatrists and psychologists who were trying to get fat people to eat less. So, Beginning in the late 1950s, from 1956 onward, the medical community, remember I said the technology you have available determines what you can learn. And depending on what you learn, that determines how much you can, you know, what your theories are. So in 1956, four groups, of re three groups of researchers uh, invented a technique to measure fatty acids in the circulation accurately. And then Rosalind Yallow and Solomon Burson in 59, 60 come out with a way to measure hormones accurately. The radioimmunoassay that won Yallow the Nobel Prize 17 years later. They can now actually study fat metabolism and what regulates it. And what they learn is insulin is the principal regulator of fat metabolism. And this is a, from a 2010 textbook uh, by, published by Keith Frain, who was at, was at Oxford, was a leading authority on fat meta on metabolism in the world. And it's insulin, 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 and then insulin inhibiting the lipolysis, the exit of fat from the fat tissue. And here's the hormonal, this is the suppression of fat mobilization, because if you want to lose weight, you've got to get fat out of your fat tissue. And it's insulin, insulin, insulin and release of fatty acids from fat cells, as Yellow and Burson said, requires only the negative stimulus of insulin deficiency. So if you want to get fat out of your fat cells, it might also require some glucagon. But they weren't studying glucagon. If you want to get fat out of your fat cell, you have to get insulin levels down. Okay, if insulin levels don't get down, and we're going to discuss, I hope, how low they have to be, you're not going to mobilize fat and burn it. 
So here's the key points of fat cell regulation. When insulin is secreted or chronically elevated, fat accumulates in the fat tissue. That's textbook medicine. Uh, look in your biochemistry or endocrinology textbooks. When insulin levels drop, fat escapes from the fat tissue and the fat depots shrink, textbook medicine. We secrete insulin primarily in response to the carbs in our diet. That's textbook medicine. So this is George Cahill, who was at Harvard in the 60s, one of the leading uh, edited a textbook on this work published by uh, the American uh, Physiology Society. And then he went on to become the uh, science director for Howard Hughes. As he put it, he said, carbohydrate is driving insulin, it's driving fat. This is what he said to me in an interview because I wanted to confirm that this was still textbook medicine. And so the interesting thing about this, con this line is if you take out is driving insulin, you have the equivalent logical statement, which is carbohydrate is driving fat. Okay, so you've got textbook medicine all the way down, and this textbook medicine, then remove the words is driving insulin, and you now have quackery. You've got Atkins. I mean, it's crazy. And when I lectured to grand rounds in medical groups, like I said, it's fascinating to watch because I usually have these doctors with me thinking, like you did, it's fascinating. Wow, this is a really interesting way to think about it. I never thought about that. This is so cool. And then I mentioned the word carbohydrate. And they're like, oh, he's one of these Atkins people. He's a quack, right? I fooled them somehow because otherwise they must have been wrong about this. Um, so here's the alternative hypothesis. Like any growth defect, obesity is a hormonal regulatory disorder. So I mean any growth defect from, um, you know, you see somebody eight feet tall, you don't care how much they're eating and exercising, you're worrying about how much growth hormone they're secreting. Like type 2 diabetes, so it associates so closely with type 2 diabetes that uh, virtually all researchers think it's, you know, the two are two sides of the same coin. It's fundamentally a disorder of insulin signaling, which makes perfect sense. And it's triggered by the carbohydrate content of the diet. So there aren't other hormonal ways to make people fat. We talked about the role of sex hormones in fat accumulation. But the link to the diet by this hypothesis is the carbohydrate content. So, and then not all carbs. This is a food guide pyramid. The high glycemic index starches and grains. So the base of the food guide pyramid, if you were looking for an association with the obesity epidemic, and then sweets, sugars. And these would be different mechanisms. In part, uh, the high GI grains would stimulate insulin secretion quickly, raise the glycemic index. The sweets are half fructose. The fructose is metabolized by the liver, and there's a lot of evidence to think that sugars or sugary beverages might be this sort of dietary trigger of insulin resistance. And if you're insulin resistant, you're over-secreting insulin to all the other carbs in the diet from these, from these other carbs in the diet. And now you have a situation where carbs that would be benign in an insulin-resistant free world, if such a thing is possible, are now forces of fat accumulation. So here's the alternative hypothesis. Refined grains, starches, and sugars cause a dysregulation of insulin signaling excess fat accumulation, obesity, and the obesity epidemic. It's a very simple hypothesis. Another way to put it would be carbohydrates are fattening, <coughs> which is an even simpler, not to everyone. To those of us who get fat easily, carbohydrates are fattening. Implications. Um, textbook of obesity in 2012, this was the last uh, Addition. This is a conventional wisdom, and they say all diets that result in weight loss do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce co total calorie intake. Um, this would be the alternative hypothesis. All diets that result in weight loss, we have to define weight loss, you know, uh, sustained weight loss, do so on one basis and one basis only. They reduce circulating insulin by restricting carbohydrates. That would be the alternative hypothesis. They're both overly simplified. This one is a biological hypothesis. This one is a physics, a, the, a misinterpretation of the laws of thermodynamics. Um, what's interesting, again, you go back further in the history and you find out there was this always, this was a conventional wisdom. The conventional wisdom was that carbohydrates are fattening. Farinaceous and vegetable foods, that means starchy, and, are fattening and saccharine matters especially so. I quoted this line in probably all of my books. This was by the 
Two authors, one of them was a leading British dietitian of the early 1960s. Everyone knows that carbohydrates are fat, and everyone knows that. They go right to my hips. Um, when you look by the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, researchers were publishing the diets that worked for obesity in their textbooks, and they were basically this. This was published in the seminal endocrinology textbook of the mid-20th century in England. Raymond Green was the brother of Graham Green. He was a leading endocrinologist of the era and a hell of a mountain climber. Foods to be avoided, and they didn't even realize the insulin link yet. Foods to be avoided, bread and everything else made with flour, cereals including breakfast cereals and puddings, potatoes, foods containing much sugar, all sweets. And you can eat as much as you like of the following foods, meat, fish, birds, all green vegetables, eggs, cheese, except for the, some of the fruit. This is the Atkins diet and published in the leading endocrine um, textbook. Harvard Medical School published a diet very similar to this. Cornell Medical School published a diet very similar to this. Stanford, Rush. This was it. I mean, some of them limited fat because they thought that fat calories weren't necessary. They all limited carbohydrates. And what's interesting, they don't give you a gram number or a percentage of calories. The idea was these foods are fattening, don't eat them. Those foods are not fattening, so you could eat as much as you want. It was a pretty simple way to think about it, but I'm not sure it was wrong. So here's the catch, and this gets to the question of why keto. Um, by the 1970s, 1980s, researchers could also measure insulin resistance and the effect of insulin as you modulated insulin levels in a human body, uh, the effect of different levels of insulin on fatty acid turnover, lipolysis, and lipogenesis. This was done by Ralph DeFranzo's group at University of Texas San Antonio. And DeFranzo was the inventor, co-inventor of the technique necessary to do this study. So what it shows is insulin levels coming down, and then the fatty acid turnover as they get down to very low levels. And as you can see, as insulin levels from huge levels, post-meal levels and day-to-day -day levels, the fatty acid turnover doesn't change. So insulin is still inhibiting fat um, mobilization from the fat tissue and um, use of that fat for fuel by the lean tissue. And then you get down to a threshold and suddenly the fat is dumped into the bloodstream and the body takes it up and starts burning it. And the way they referred to it in the paper is insulin regulation of plasma-free fatty acid turnover oxidation is maximally manifest at low physiological plasma insulin concentrations. When Yalow and Burson talked about the negative signal of insulin deficiency, they meant deficiency. Um, many of the researchers I interviewed, and they used the same terminology in the paper, talked about the exquisite sensitivity of fat cells to insulin. If there's any excess insulin in the bloodstream at all, your fat cells respond to it and will not mobilize fat. So you have to be below this threshold. It's like a switch. And if you're below that threshold, you will probably be in ketosis, because ketosis is only going to happen when you're mobilizing your fat and burning it for fuel, or your liver is burning it for fuel. So the way I think about it now is a switch has to be thrown, and we don't know where that switch is. It's surely in a different place for all of us. For the idea behind Atkins and keto is you minimize insulin. If you minimize insulin, you will be below that threshold for the maximum amount of time in the day, and you will be burning fat rather than storing it. And what's fascinating is when Atkins was ridiculed in the early 1970s and turned into a sort of synonym for quackery in the medical community, this was an article published in JAMA. Um, it was under the auspices of the Councils on Food and Nutrition, but it was written by two uh, physicians, uh, cardiologist in New York who hated Atkins and knew him and had been his um, advisor and then uh, uh, a nutritionist who had been at Harvard. Uh, critique of low carb regimens, ketogenic regimens, fat is mobilized. And what it says, fat is mobilized when insulin secretion diminishes and yet low carbohydrate diets are bizarre concept of nutrition that should not be promoted to the public as if they were established scientific principles without thinking that a low carbohydrate diet is the way you minimize insulin secretion. Yes. Uh, that was the end result. They wanted to get rid of Atkins. They thought the diets were going to kill people because they're high in saturated fat and uh, uh, 
ketoacidosis scares the hell for good reason out of uh, physicians, but they didn't realize that nutritional ketosis and ketoacidosis are entirely different things. So they wanted to get rid of Atkins, and in order to get rid of Atkins, you had to get rid of the science behind Atkins. So Atkins was the bathwater, the endocrinology was the baby, and by the 1980s, there was no discussion anymore of the hormonal endocrinological regulation of fat metabolism in obesity textbooks or obesity papers because if you discuss that, you are led de facto to a low-carbohydrate diet. Carbohydrates as the cause and a low-carb diet as the um, means of prevention and cure. Okay, thank you. <laughs>